The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're getting started a little late today. We're sorry about that. We're having some technical difficulties with the uh, webinar platform, but I think we probably worked those out. So hopefully we won't have any interruptions today, and we're glad that everybody could be here. So I'm going to go ahead and get things started for us. My name is Andrew Capehart. I'm with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Strategies for APS Cases Involving Homelessness and Housing Insecurity, with our very own Krista Brown, Training Specialist with the APS TARC. I'll be uh, doing a formal introduction introduction of Krista shortly. Next slide. Before we get started, uh, a little bit of information, a quick disclaimer. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. The contractor's findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Uh, next slide. The APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and then encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We're basically here to help APS programs in any way that we possibly can. Um, if you are a state APS program and you want technical assistance on something that maybe you haven't seen us publish anything on, we haven't done toolkits or webinars, or even if it is something we've published something uh, on a subject, reach out to us at any time. You can always ask for individual technical assistance on any topic you like, and there'll be contact information for us in just a bit at the end of the webinar. Uh, next slide. A little bit of housekeeping in the handout section of your webinar control panel. You'll find today's slides. You can download those at any time, and they'll also be posted online at a later date. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for the webinar. Make sure that the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar or close it out and then re-enter, uh, log back in. So basically close things out and try and come back in if you have any problems that usually fixes most things. Next slide. We are planning to have time at the end of the panel discuss of uh, the end of today's webinar for questions and comments, but you may ask questions of our presenter at any time. You can just type them in the questions box. You don't have to wait until it's time for questions. You can type them as they occur to you. We'll relay as many of the questions as we can to our speaker at the end of the presentation. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the TARC website at a later date, along with a copy of the slides. We'll notify everyone who's registered when it is posted online. And then everyone attending the webinar today will get an email about 24 hours after we conclude with a certificate of attendance. You can download that um, at your leisure when you get that um, email. And then also please respond to the uh, webinar survey that pops up when we conclude things and also comes in the email that's sent to you. If you could respond to that, that really helps us out quite a bit. Let's us know what you thought and what we should plan on for next year. So next slide. So I'm going to administer a quick attendee poll. Give me one minute to fire this up and you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. I have launched that poll. Um, which of the following categories do you identify the most with? Would you say that you're an APS professional, an other social services professional, um, a medical professional, legal professional or other, and you should be able to vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you're in full screen mode, you might have trouble, you might have to exit full screen mode to vote. Um, but we'll leave this open for just a little bit so that we can get a, a quick feel for what type of folks are on the call today. And this is really just how you identify your profession, uh, which of these categories seem to resonate the most with you. All right, I think we'll leave that up for about 10 more seconds. Most folks have voted. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll out right now and share the results. So we are over, well, overwhelmingly APS professionals on today's call at 79%. 17% of you consider yourself other. Uh, we don't have any medical folks, few legal folks, and a few who could just consider themselves other in general. So thanks for responding to that poll. It really helps us out and know who we're talking to. So uh, next slide. It is my great pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Krista Brown. 
I'm sure many of you are familiar with Krista already, but uh, for those of you who are not, she joined the APS TARC in August of last year as a training specialist. She oversees the design and delivery of training and related support to state APS programs and federal grantee recipients. She has 20 years experience working in the aging and adult services field in both direct service and training. Most recently, Krista was the APS Leaders Institute Program Coordinator with the APSWI Academy for Professional Excellence, where she oversaw the implementation of all facets of the ACL-funded California APS Leaders Institute. In this role, she worked with the county, state, and national stakeholders and subject matter experts to begin development of an APS supervisor core competency curricula for California. Previously, Krista worked with the National Adult Protective Services Association, or NAPSA, on deliverables related to national grants and contracts member professional development activities and organizational development. She's also former director of education at the American Society on Aging. She's one of my favorite people on the planet. And we're really lucky to have Krista talking to us today. So I will turn things over to you, Krista. Thanks, Andy. My goodness, that, what a what a wonderful introduction. I'm kind of I'm kind of clumped here. Hi, everybody. I'm really really happy um, and excited and grateful to bring you this webinar um, for a few different reasons. Um, this issue is touching most all of us professionally as the rate of homeless or housing insecure individuals rise. You may be seeing this reflected in your APS statutes, programs, and caseloads. Too often these are complex cases that take time, resources, and multidisciplinary partners and approaches. And often APS, the program of last return, or as our colleagues in the Virgin Islands call it, APS equals all problems solved, you receive these reports. Um, this issue is also touching us personally. In fact, this is front and center in my own community. I live in Oakland, California, the largest city in Alameda County, and our 2022 point in time homeless count was 5,054 individuals, and that probably was an under count. Um, the majority fell into the unsheltered category, living in street, tent, car, RV, or squatting, and 17% um, experienced their first episode of homelessness at age 50 to 64, and then 2% were 65 years plus. So um, again, it's touching us uh, individually and professionally. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to um, Catherine Preston Wager from APS Workforce Innovations and the Academy for Professional Excellence and all of the curriculum developers who developed the webinar series, I'm sorry, the uh, virtual curriculum um, series, Effectively Working APS Cases for Persons Experiencing Homelessness. I have adapted um, the information from the, those um, courses for this webinar today, and believe you me, I'm just touching the surface. So please do check those out. We have um, a, a link to the, um, to the entire series on the resource slide at the end of the presentation. So thank you, APSWI, for developing um, such great curriculum. All right, so let's get moving on here. Um, we're gonna go ahead and have a couple polls because I'd like to set the stage. I understand that we are mostly APS professionals here, but um, Andy, if you wouldn't mind launching the first poll, are you currently working with clients who are experiencing homelessness? So. Thank you, Krista. There you go. That yeah, no problem. Live, folks are voting right now. Um, oh. Again, you can, vote by clicking directly on your screen. You may have to exit full screen mode if you're in full screen mode. We'll keep this up and running for just another 20 seconds or so to give folks a chance to vote. Perfect. I'll give about 10 more seconds then I'll close this out. Thanks to everybody for Voting, so I'm going to close that out now and share the results with everyone. Uh, Krista, there you go. Great. So let's see what we got here. We have yes, 68%, no, 29%, and a few unsure. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That's that's good to know. That's good information for all of us to have. Um, Andy, could you launch the other poll? Certainly. Uh, uh, poll question. Great. Yep. We'll go to question two. I'll launch that right now. And again, so, have that up on your screen. Yeah. 
So question number two is how confident are you at it, understanding the needs of those experiencing homelessness or who are facing the possibility of being homeless? And please be honest because these, this is a really complex topic. So are you feeling confident? Are you neutral? Are you not confident? Uh, does this not apply to you at this, at this point? Um, Actually, I, I left that one off, but you could give us a, a in the question box, you could do an NA if you wanted to. But feeling confident, feeling neutral, or not confident. I'll leave this up for about five more seconds, maybe 10 more okay. seconds. Sure. I know that when I was an APS worker, I would have said not confident, even though I've worked a lot of these cases. I don't feel like I'm ever terribly confident about it. So we'll close this out. Right Great. Now. Thank you. Yep, and share the responses. Uh, there you go. Perfect. They're coming up for me. All right. We've got we've got quite a few neutrals. That's cool. We've been we've got a few confidence and a few uh, even more not confidence. Okay, cool. So here we are. That's that's a that's our our ground that we're going to. Uh, that we laid out. So because the impact of homelessness affects our personal space, our community space, and our professional space, working with those experiencing homelessness may affect us differently than working with someone, uh, someone on other allegations such as caregiver neglect or financial abuse. Like Andy just said, he worked many of these cases and he still wasn't feeling that confident. This can also lead to some conflicted feelings about and thoughts about um, individuals who are homeless and may require more considerations and insight into our own um, thinking than other populations. So I wanna say it's okay to feel conflicted in this webinar. That's why we're here today starting a conversation. This will definitely not be the, the last conversation um, that we'll have around working um, with, with um, people in these populations. Um, APS professionals can align their knowledge and professional values and maximize, maximize their effectiveness as they work with a homeless and or housing insecure population. So we can do this. We just need to look at our, our skills. So um, this webinar is going to be broken into three different parts. We're going to start by laying a foundation about what we know to be unique traits, challenges, and protective factors for people who are experiencing um, homelessness or housing insecurity. And then part two are methods to work cases effectively, safely, and in a trauma-informed manner. Um, and then lastly, hopefully we'll have some time to look at some APS um, programs that are working with these populations within their communities um, as a model. And I just do want to remind you, we have a lot of material here. We could have easily had a, a 90 minute or a two hour webinar, but today we're with each other for about 75 minutes. So we'll be ending at about 4.15 Eastern. So if you do need to leave us on the hour, it is being recorded and please catch it when, when you can. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, set a stage. And um, to do that, sometimes we need to look at some different definitions in language. So in your, um, your uh, webinar panel, there in the handouts uh, portion, there is a handout that is excerpted from the uh, curricula from APSWI. And it is all the definitions that you would need to know um, around working with um, these different populations. And a few of them, it's, this is, our slides definitely do not have all of the definitions the handout do, but a few that I just wanted to kind of bring front of mind for us today. Um, so APSWI uh, has given us on the definitions handout, um, the, the HUD definition of chronic homelessness, which I'm not gonna go over today just for time, but uh, the term continuums of care, um, you may have these local planning bodies um, in your region. Uh, they are responsible for coordinating the full range of homelessness services. Um, a term that is I'm becoming more familiar with and you, I'm gonna try to use it as much as possible um, is houseless. Um, so that is a term that um, takes, tries to take the pejorative meaning um, away from what has um, become around the word homeless. So houseless describes individuals as having a connection. So they have a place in our society, in our community, even if they don't have an actual physical space, a house to live in. 
Other terms that you may or may not be um, familiar with, precarious housing. Um, this is may, could, could be a new a newer term for some. Um, so that is somebody who's currently housed but likely to become homeless. Um, and this is generally because of housing um, affordability issues. And then there is the sheltered and unsheltered homelessness. So um, sheltered homelessness are folks that are staying in shelters, transitional housing, safe havens, and then unsheltered homelessness um, are folks that are typically um, residing in on the streets, vehicles, parks, tents, um, and the such. So, so that is for our definitions to, um, to kind of set the stage. So the research shows us two major divisions when it comes to especially older adult homelessness. There is homelessness before 50 and homelessness after 50. And the reason for the split, or there are a couple reasons actually. So individuals who are homeless before 50 um, often have different foundational issues than individual, individuals who become homeless after 50. So um, it's important to note that homelessness has an extreme impact on someone's aging. And so we'll, we'll uh, touch on that a little bit later. Um, this is important because APF, APS professionals oh, want to keep that in mind as they're creating their service plan. So for homelessness before 50, I, I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, which was done in the 90s by the CDC. Uh, Centers for Disease um, Control and the uh, Kaiser. Um, and they asked a, a series of questions. And what the research has borne out is individuals who experience homelessness before age 50 frequently have had a life path with multiple adverse child events and a high ACEs score. So this probably makes sense to a lot of us. Um, some of the probable outcomes of early childhood adversity. Um, so having high ACEs, so, and then having a high ACEs score has been associated with higher probability of juvenile and young adult incarceration, early substance use, unstable work history, mental health issues, and traumatic brain injury. So the longer time period of these experiences are associated with a higher probability of the early onset of homelessness. So this is bi-directional. So impact, um, so the impact is really bi-directional. So issues involving homelessness and um, these, these high ACEs experiences impact each other. So for example, while mental health issues and substance use may predispose um, someone towards homelessness, once an individual is homeless, their substance use and mental health issues are likely to increase. Um, and these things can lead to homelessness before 50. So homelessness after 50, so if we're looking at, at adverse childhood experiences leading to predisposing factors of homelessness before 50, why does homelessness after 50 happen? Um, well, individuals who first experience homelessness after 50 often have been impacted by factors such as unexpected life events and unaffordable housing. Um, at the same time, there are societal and political events that have in, impacted them, and you'll see some of those on the slide. Um, so you add this societal and political events plus the aging process, which may complicate folks' lives a little bit more with some ad additional expenses and a potential fixed income. Um, and then they may find as they age that their needs are very different than, than what they thought they would be. Um, so the current episode of homelessness uh, began in the 80s um, and a wave of homelessness began, but certain events laid the groundwork for homelessness to continue growing. So we had changes in the 70s around 401ks. Uh, in the 80s, uh, then President Reagan um, had the deinstitutionalization de process um, that released many people with behavioral health issues onto the street without adequate supports. And then the second half of the baby boomer group became, uh, became adults. And then there were recessions and rising pressure on service programs and tax cuts and decreases of social services and so on and so forth. So these really laid the groundwork for a lot of what we're seeing around um, 
the homeless crisis and the older adult homeless crisis. Um, the other thing is that older adults especially, they, they can't work their way out of poverty like um, some younger folks and how some potential other people think that folks can work their way out of poverty. So this is, this is, these are some of the factors. Um, so you might be asking yourself, well, this is all very interesting, but why does, why does this matter to me as an APS professional? Well, if we think about it in the strengths and needs kind of buckets, um, homelessness before 50, the strengths that the folks have are basically survival skills and street knowledge. And they may be more likely to know who to trust, where to stay, and how to get their basic needs met. Um, so as an APS professional, if you're working with someone, um, helping them understand that their survival skills are a strength and really leveraging that. Um, on the flip side of it, these folks will probably be more likely to have long-term problems, potential men mental health conditions, substance use histories, uh, potential for um, a history of incarceration, poor employment, and potentially reduced benefits. So the needs would be social service supports, potentially life skills training, and then permanent supportive housing. Um, for someone who's homeless after 50, and this may be a little counterintuitive, um, they actually have a history of functionality in basic life needs, more than likely they do. So paying bills, making appointments, being able to make phone calls. And this, there could be a return to that functionality if um, supportive housing um, is part of the plan for them. Uh, the other thing, another need aside from uh, aside from helping folks have their functionality and housing stability uh, replaced is is also um, there potentially could be some unexpected grief around losing the life that they had expected to have. Um, so maybe the concept of of, of the, your golden years and it's not um, it's not what you had um, expected. So for both of these groups, um, we as professionals can validate their strengths and hopefully instill some hope. Um, and APS professionals, definitely, you, you all excel at that. So I thought that was an important thing to, to bring into this. Another factor to consider is, um, is the length of homelessness. Um, so we often use the terms this population or those experience homelessness, I'm doing it here in this training, I'm guilty of it. Um, it's always important to remember that people experience it differently at different times and for different lengths of time. So we have some causes and considerations here. So imminent risk of homelessness, APS may be seeing this more often than not, uh, could be um, due to financial abuse, uh, eviction, um, self-neglect, um, hoarding situations, uh, newly homeless or transitional homelessness. Um, so could be a result of a structural economic constraint, cost of housing, inflation, um, healthcare catastrophes uh, that are unexpected, um, impact of social situations, um, potentially re being released from incarcer incarceration, leaving an institution or a skilled nursing facility against medical advice um, in, with deteriorating health, um, any, new, you know, any myriad of, of things. Um, and then chronic homelessness, um, these are folks that typically are com have complex and chronic health needs and risks. Uh, they may be survivors of long-term and multiple episodes of homelessness. Um, they often re refuse help, um, and often this group requires interventions that, um, that are attractive to clients like housing to engage. Um, and then some folks have serious and persist persistent mental health or substance use. Um, what all three of these uh, these buckets um, share is all, all of these folks share an inherent trauma of experiencing homelessness. So 
We're going to move into a, a little bit different angle on this, um, physical, mental, and cognitive health. Um, these are all compromised by homelessness. Each of these issues can place an individual at greater risk for homelessness. And in turn, being homeless exacerbates all of these issues. Then it creates a, a cycle of decline. Um, so this is the part of the training that can be very, um, it can be frustrating for APS professionals because a lot of what we're talking about is more on the macro level. And you as an APS professional may feel a bit um, helpless or hopeless, but I'm hoping that we can, by talking about these factors and sharing some strategies that hopefully that will make you feel a bit more empowered um, to, when you're doing your work. So have a chat question for you. So if you could use your chat box um, and then Andy is going to, um, Andy, I'll let you know um, after um, I move on just due to time. Sure. So if you could use your, your chat question, your chat box of, of the APS referrals accepted for investigation involving homelessness. So those of you who said you yes to, I am working these cases, what co-occurring condition or conditions are also present. So you go ahead and take a thought on that and type those in the chat box and I'm gonna move on and then we'll circle back and look at some of your, your responses. So, okay, let's tackle physical health and homelessness. So homelessness results in a decreased lifespan of about 10 to 20 years and that's based on research which makes 50 the new 70 for a homeless individual. Um, some of the other factors are there are higher rates of impairment based on activities of daily living. Compliance with medical treatment is super difficult if you do not have stable housing. Um, you can't comply with medications. You, you can't really look at your diet. Um, adaptive equipment may get lost or stolen. And even getting to medical care um, is a challenge. So, what might be a good angle when you're trying to help an individual make a choice to protect themselves by by avoiding so basically having folks not avoid those small physical health issues can be a protective factor so having really leaning into the safety versus self-determination. If, if someone is wanting to have more freedom and not be institutionalized, just trying to be more proactive on um, um, dealing with the smaller level um, situations so that it, you don't enter into the hospital to nursing facility to shelter to street to hospital um, kind of cycle. And what, what can really help with that, of course, is if there is stable housing as part of it. Part of the picture. Andy, any um, responses? Yeah, it looks like a lot of people say substance abuse and mental health. Um, those are okay. probably the two most popular ones. Several people said everything except dementia, but then other people also mentioned neurocognitive issues as well. But we're seeing okay. a lot of behavioral and substance abuse um, issues. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, then we are going to move on to mental health and homelessness. So, um, Yes, it it is. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the percentages in the population for sure. But let's first talk about there is a layer of bias um, that's placed onto homeless individuals that many or most individuals are severely and persistently mentally ill. Um, so while anyone who's homeless will be struggling with issues like trauma, depression, and anxiety, that's different from having the societal perception of homeless people as is severely mentally ill. So you can think to yourself, for, and I'll ask this rhetorically, what percentage of the homeless population do you believe live with severe men mental illness? And I will tell you that studies have consistently found that severe mental health issues in the homeless population are between 25 and 30%. Yes, that is high. Um, but that is not is not the majority of, of folks. So it's important to realize that when an APS professional has buy-in to the bias of um, you know most, if not all, folks on, on that are um, houseless have severe mental illness. Um, 
this can impact the way that we provide services. Um, this is especially true because some mental health issues such as anxiety or PTSD, when exacerbated by circumstances can imitate severe and persistent mental health issues. That said, it is worth also acknowledging too that severe mental illness is much higher in the homeless population. Um, so we're talking 25 to 30% versus 5.6% in the general population. So while someone shouldn't assume mental illness, it is important to be on the lookout for it. And as APS professionals, you're working with individuals with mental health issues all of the time. Those who are homeless have similar diagnoses, but don't always meet the criteria for severe, severely mentally ill, as many people think. So you can take your skills that you already have working with individuals who are living with mental illness and apply those to, um, to folks that are houseless when appropriate. But that said, um, addressing this, these issues as soon as they are seen um, by, by APS and or other providers and then referring um, as soon as possible to mental health resources is always, is always the key. So mental health and homelessness risk factors. So um, the mental health disorders that place you at higher risk for homelessness bipolar disorder, severe depression, and any mental health disorder with an element of psychosis um, and including PTSD. So mental health issues that are severe and persistent can really dominate a person's life and require constant management and care for folks to be functional. Um, and these mental health disorders are risk factors for becoming homeless before 50 if you don't have um, those supports. So how to interact, and I say this um, as some of the be more of a best practice versus a, a recommendation to go out and engage with someone act actively in psychosis. So that's not, that's not what we're saying here, but how to interact um, with, with potentially with some of the behaviors that come with these more severe um, mental health disorders. So psychosis, brings fear, anxiety, paranoia, and confusion. So you would want to build rapport and go slowly if you are working with someone who maybe isn't actively in a psychotic state, um, but who um, may have periods of psychosis. Bipolar disorder, uh, mood swings, irritability, or the highest of highs, and risky behaviors. Um, you can listen to what is behind the behaviors and expect that progress will um, have um, some slide backs. And then severe depression, um, that can be challenging. There can be a lack of motivation. And so taking tasks and breaking them into smaller steps and validation along the way is, is um, what is recommended. And then in of, of course, APS is very good at this, encouraging and aiding um, folks to to seek um, behavioral health and mental health help when when at all possible. So something that a few of you mentioned um, it was in the co cognitive health realm um, for folks that you're working with who who may be homeless or um, uh, potentially homeless. So this is something that we focus on a little bit less, I'd, I'd say. So cognition is the ability to think, to learn, and to remember. Um, cognitive health can be impaired by many issues. As APS well knows, there could be UTIs. Um, mental health issues can mix really confusedly with cognitive declines. Um, poor cognitive health can be both a risk factor and an outcome of homelessness. And not surprisingly, cognitive impairment is much higher in homeless adults than in the general population. Um, there's one study found that one third of homeless adults had cognitive impairment. Um, also, we, we know from our experience for, with working with, um, with folks, whether they're housed or not, or even potentially some family members, um, people experiencing cognitive impairment are often not forthcoming about the circumstance. Um, they may be embarrassed and have fears of institutionalization. Um, so that would have implications for your service planning as well. Um, 
older adults who are homeless and people who are homeless may not prioritize cognitive engagement uh, due to the need to prioritize basic survival. So, um, and that's valid, that's, that's very valid. Um, but understanding that there could be these problems and impairments, um, someone may have a degree stability to problem solve. Um, they could appear uncooperative, um, but it could be something else. Um, so it may not be willfulness or opposition or refusal. Um, it could be something linked to, to cognition. So if you suspect um, cognitive health issues, APS professionals can encourage, should encourage, um, and help the person get a physical or mental health assessment to either rule in or rule out potentially 55 different causes of cognitive impairment. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, is when a person is more stably housed, that can also uh, create a, a, a significant change in their, in their cog cognitive um, status. So substance use, okay, well that came up obviously. And again, there's another layer of societal bias um, common um, with homeless individuals that the majority are substance users. Research estimates that 35% of homeless adults struggle with substance use. Yes, that is high, but it is again, not the, not the majority. Um, one of the most challenging circumstances um, seen for APS and anyone working with, with humans is the co-occurrence of substance use and mental health uh, disorders or dual diagnoses. Um, it's really hard to gather data um, and the research varies on the estimate of homeless um, individuals with co-occurring disorders. But there's agreement that these individuals are overrepresented in the homeless population. So some challenges when working with substance abuse and homelessness. So um, especially if you're trying to help someone get into treatment, there is a lack of integrated programs for co-occurring diagnoses. Um, an, an integrated program approach, um, that is not a standard success and recovery and length of program are correlated. So if you have a shorter term um, substance use uh, disorder treatment, um, that probably is not going to address, you know, numerous years of, of, um, of use. Uh, returning somebody um, back to the streets is often gonna give, you know, return them back to the circumstances that promoted the use of substances in the very beginning. Um, and there can be trust issues. Um, so trust, lack of trust in authority figures um, and the such. So those, those can be pretty big challenges that folks face. Um, older adults and homelessness and substance use. So older adults who are homeless with substance use have often become homeless before the age of 50. So we talked about that and they've aged on the streets. Um, for individuals who became homeless after 50, there's a lower rate of substance use independence. However, homeless individuals overall with substance use remain overrepresented. Um, and as many of you know, uh, the older population, the most common drug of choice is, is alcohol. So um, substances in substance use can, can differ for older adults and you see some, you see some um, factors there um, on what can make things become more severe. Um, our bodies change as we age, me our metabolism, our liver functions. Uh, if folks are on medication, there could be medication interactions. Falls can be deadly. Um, and then unfortunately, substance use treatment programs are typically geared towards a younger population. So again, how APS professionals can help. So. I just wanna validate that working with individuals with substance use disorders can be challenging, whether housed or not. Um, and as with all other service planning, having multiple tools in your toolbox, um, no matter how small they are, is, is really helpful. So some activities to consider, uh, social support, um, more social support, 
equates better psychological health and better outcome for recovery from substance use. So let the lack of social support be a sign of what needs to be done. Um, APS can explore access to social networks currently present. So if that's within the, um, the homeless community or the or outside, uh, 12 strep groups, senior centers, uh, spiritual organizations, um, creating a safe space for the person during outreach so they're not fearful and they're listening to you. Um, understanding that when a person is homeless, has substance abuse treatment may not seem all that important compared to securing safe housing. Again, um, hard to be focusing on these things when um, you are have a, a one of those Maslow's hierarchy of needs not being met. Um, and you just have to really ask yourself, is there anyone who's ready to do away with a coping skill but keep the problem? Um, and to be honest, I probably would probably have to answer no to that. Um, collaboration with other social services agencies has proven to be very effective um, to help people um, build a support system. Harm reduction. Um, for those who have found their alcohol use to be problematic um, has been shown to be more effective than abstinence and there are some studies out there. And then also don't assume that because someone has been using for a long time they won't agree to treatment. So don't, don't ever take that off the table. And then a, a great resource that's out there, there's the link on the slide, is something called TIP 55 behavioral health services for people who are homeless, and that's a SAMHSA publication. So go ahead and, and check that out and see if you can integrate that into your, your practice. So, all right, um, and I am gonna speed it up here a little bit. So now part two, so this is the part that I, I there's always so much to share to build that foundation, and sometimes we shortchange the methods and strategies for APS to work the case effectively and safely. So I'm gonna, I'm going to go ahead and, and make sure that we cover this um, because we did get started a little bit late. So another poll question to help us start this section. Um, so Andy, could you go ahead and launch our, I believe our last poll? Sure, uh, yeah, do that. I will launch it right now. Yeah, what is your most frequently used method of handling cases involving homelessness, housing insecurity? So do you refer to housing, homeless services, you attempt to find placement in public housing, attempt to find placement in APS funded temporary housing, and maybe that's possible because of the newer monies or other. And please use the question box for that. Um, and just to keep in mind, you can only vote for one. So this is your most frequently yes. used method. You may use all Thank these, but you. what's your most frequently used method? Thank you, thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Yes, I wanted to uh, create some constraints there. So, voting for one. Looks like about a third of folks have voted. So we'll leave it open for maybe about 10 more seconds. I think people Great. are thinking about this one. This is a, uh, could be a tough one and it's a good one to think about. Yeah. All right, well, I think I'm gonna close that out. We have about 60% of the vote and share the responses. There you go. Great, thank you. Okay, so the majority looks like you refer to housing and homelessness services and then a smattering attempting to place in public housing, attempting to find placement APS funded, and then some others, and I see in the others um, some responses there. I just lost them. You want me to read those Sorry. for you, Krista? Yeah, that would be great, sure. thank you. One person said the senior safe house, and this was someone from Sacramento. Um, so apparently they might right. have a senior shelter of some form. They do, they um, do. And then another person said we most frequently tried to get a long-term care Medicaid in place and then place into a facility if applicable, they said. Great, thank you. Okay, so for anyone who's going out on these cases, let's talk, um, let's talk about safety um, for a minute. So safety in the field. Um, let's start with safety prior to meeting with your, um, your client. Uh, it is imperative and some programs require it that folks go out in teams when meeting people experiencing homelessness. 
Um, so some of the promising practices, best practices around this is go in pairs whenever possible, um, especially when working outside of fixed outreach sites or entering unknown areas and coordinating with your, your partner early before you go out. Uh, develop a contingency plan before leaving the office. Um, that could be with the person you're going out with, your supervisor. Uh, determine a code word um, before approaching your client or going out. So that could be used to indicate a safety issue, a level of discomfort. If what you or your partner uses the code word, then you exit the situation as soon as possible. No questions asked. You see the example here, where Charlotte. So something uh, uh, innocuous. Um, and then really plan. So conduct your gear up and your debrief with your team and your supervisor. Always keep others informed of your whereabouts. Um, do not plan outreach for areas in which you believe are inherently dangerous. Um, if the person you're trying to reach has a working cell phone and you can reach them, you could potentially request to meet in a public space. That's convenient for both of you. Don't approach people who are giving signs that they don't want to be approached. Carrying your business cards, your, your lanyard with your ID, always good. Bringing some, some personal protective equipment with you, gloves, mask, extra masks, hand sanitizer. Um, try not to enter clients' cars, homes, enclosed areas. Try not to wake them and don't peek into tents. Um, you could maybe call out the person's name, but then you also have to be cognizant of confidentiality, so that gets a little tricky. Um, but so, so those are some of the tips that we are offering. So safety during the meeting, um, introduce yourself and inform um, people what you are doing and why. Don't carry valuables or other personal possessions. Um, if you're carrying an incentive, maybe have that held in a secure place and just really take the least amount of items with you as possible. Don't interrupt drugs, um, interrupt sales of drugs or sex, um, leave the area immediately. If you suspect that your client is under the influence, consider rescheduling and visiting on a different day. Uh, and this is obvious, but we're gonna say it, do not accept or hold any type of controlled substance and refrain petting animals. Um, and in an emergency, call 911, really listen to your intuition and your gut with this. And then upon completion, really great if you have the ability to sit down um, in consultation with a multidisciplinary team to really get on the same page, clarify issues, understand common ground. If, you, if your statute or policy allows you to invite partners like housing representatives and mental health providers and homeless services uh, providers to your MDT, that would be great. Um, you can share insights, experiences, and, and be more effective. And then training, advocating for agency-wide training focused on safety, crisis management, nonviolent crisis intervention, and just looking at the, your, your um, individual and team safety protocols on a regular basis and um, in updating those if you need to. So best part of this uh, this webinar, I think, is meeting Iris. So let's think back to the safety discussion we just had in planning for outreach. Specifically, we're going to meet up with Iris. And Iris is in her late 60s and has been homeless for about five years, referred to APS by the County Homeless Outreach and Engagement Team. Uh, Iris is staying alone near the park benches, but often visits the local senior center. She has a prepaid cell phone and one bag of personal belongings. And um, outreach and engagement team is reporting self-neglect. Uh, Iris has diabetes and a large wound on her left foot, but has not sought medical treatment in several months. And reports that Iris is friendly, but has some untreated mental health issues. And she receives a monthly disability check is, and is Medi-Medi, so Medicaid, Medicare recipient. So what are, the some, what are some of the things that you would want to do to prepare 
or think about before meeting Iris. So we know some of her situation as it pertains to safety and planning for outreach. So what are some of the things that you would take into consideration? Um, and go ahead and put those into the box. Um, give some thought to that. And I'm going to go ahead and move on to outreach really quick and then we'll circle back. So making contact with individuals in non-traditional needs who might otherwise be ignored or underserved, we can use the principles of outreach. So we're creating a human connection, we're building trust, we're de developing a sense of community, a sense of dignity and respect, and we're being honest. So the idea of in-reach, uh, so you're walking with people to services they need, so outreach and in-reach go hand in hand. Um, your initial approach and first impression are major factors in a person uh, accepting services. Uh, you need to determine the right time of day to visit a client. Now this is particularly important with, with um, someone who is housing unstable or houseless. You probably don't want to visit during meal or shower time. Um, People who are unsheltered tend to be less active in the morning um, because they may be sleeping because they're at, uh, at night, they're awake for safety. Um, so you may wanna schedule appointments later in the day. Um, there are hierarchical constructs in homeless uh, communities. And so you might wanna consider building relationships with gatekeepers in those communities. They can have influence with um, a larger group and may have leverage with, with the person you are meeting with. Um, and then also just forming relationships with, with staff at homeless service centers um, and any of your other collaborators in the field. The idea of respecting an individual's three homes, so their personal space, their physical space where they live and the community which they live. Um, letting the person know your first goal is to getting to the, know them as a, as a human. Um, using active listening and reflection, you're responding, you're not reacting. Um, you let the client decide if they want to proceed with the discussion and you let them know when you will be back and how you, you can be reached. It may take repeat visits to build that trust. And you may wanna consider um, carrying emergency items, hygiene kits, water, snacks, incontinence products, if those are available um, through your agency. And then keeping initial conversations somewhat brief um, could help avoid um, overwhelming the, the client. So Andy, let's circle back um, to Iris. And sure. what did folks say? I had a lot of thoughts on that. Um, several people mentioned. Cool family, researching what the family is that may have been involved at some point. Nice. Um, questions about, you know, income that she's receiving. Of course, if she was receiving veteran benefits, that may entitle her to more benefits than she's getting. Um, mm -hmm. House call physicians was mentioned as one option. I've heard of that mm -hmm. in my own community when I was APS. Um, let's see. Um, again, family in the area, uh, arranging to meet a client, doing a background check to see if there's any criminal history or an internet search to see if there's criminal history, which could reveal substance abuse, history of eviction, et cetera. Um, and then also providing a list of resources like local food pantries in case um, Iris is not aware of that. Um, and also building rapport with Iris was mentioned as something that was very important. Great. Awesome. Thank you all. That's, those are great responses. So just really um, quickly, engagement and assessment. So once you have made that initial contact um, with your potential client, you're building that engagement so that folks are feeling more comfortable with you. Um, you're gonna try to get to know the client's personal narrative to build that trust and rapport. You're gonna show empathy. You're gonna express appreciation for their survival skills as, as strengths and their coping mechanisms. Um, if you can try to, ha try to have a consistent presence in the community, you're going to build your reputation. It increases your visibility and your approachability. If you can be consistent and predictable, that is really hard with people who are homeless. They're very mobile. Um, so um, that, that could be tricky. 
um, but continuity, regular regularity um, with providers, it really helps build trust and familiarity. Um, you don't have to have someone, so that collaborative nature is um, trying to work with our collaborators in the field so that the person doesn't have to retell their story over and over again, which is also trauma-informed um, and can be really helpful for the early stages of engagement. Um, if you say you're going to complete a task, always follow through. Um, so that knows your, that know, means knowing your limitations and boundaries before engaging with that client. Um, client readiness is an important indicator of success. There's a high probability that the client is not ready to engage due to fear, mistrust, their you know, mental illness and other issues. Um, share resources and guidance, but allow the client to follow through. Um, and then decide how you can help the client achieve the goals that you each um, collaboratively plan and consider working towards small steps. So if you can utilize mot motivational interviewing when appropriate, using your SMART goals, so specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound to help you create a plan um, that really kind of highlights the person's strengths and honors their current situation. Um, you can utilize the principles of har um, harm reduction. So, you know, if that's access to clean needles or any other harm reduction um, type of, of service you can offer in your, your county or ju jurisdiction. And then one that I don't know that gets paid attention to much is paying attention to the person's health literacy. So is the client able to read and have a level of understanding. So you may want to be open to presenting information in different ways. So, and last but not least, I mean, we have to really balance the client's freedom of choice with the severity of the conditions and the limitations of your role. So this is not easy, definitely. Um, APS, you know that each allegation and every person is different, which way, which means there's no way to engage and assess a, someone whether they're they're completely housed or or houseless. Um, but we'll cover some general ideal steps when you meet with somebody. So, what are your top priorities at a, as APS? Well, uh, a biopsychosocial assessment. So, you're looking at is emergency medical treatment necessary? Do we need to involve, involve authorities? Um, is there in, does there need to be an involuntary hold or do we need to call the paramedics? Um, are, are you're assessing for any kind of physical conditions, um, trying to get a sense of if folks can take care of themselves, if there's any finances. Um, and this will all help you with determining what would be a good um, potential housing option if that is on the table. Um, you're going to want to help with um, completing forms. So offering to assist client with completing forms to link to services. So is that benefit enrollment in California? There's in-home supportive services applications, um, helping a client plan to attend an appointment, um, outreach and collaboration with other community agencies. We've already said this over and over, really heavily impacts the continuity of care. So um, really getting to know the providers in your referral network, um, in, introducing your client in a face-to-face -face meeting, or they may be doing that vice versa. Um, your client may already be or was previously linked to services, so initiating contact with those providers is really important. Warm handoffs, um, alternatives, uh, hotels, room and board, those kinds of things. So um, those are just a few different ideas. I'm sorry, we're moving a little fast here, but here we are. We're going to engage uh, IRIS. So when completing a biopsychosocial assessment with IRIS, what outreach elements would you consider exploring? And I think I heard a few, Andy, from our last list, but if there's any other things that you would want to put in the questions box, so what elements would you consider exploring in regards to completing a biopsychosocial assessment with IRIS? 
And while you do that, I'm going to move on to psychoeducation. So uh, psychoeducation is a large part of what APS does uh, within their investigations and interventions. And this component is where you might spend a lot of time when working with people experiencing homelessness. So think about building off the client's strengths and resiliency. Um, so what might this look like? Uh, it could be providing information and educating clients about their illness and options for treatment to imp improve their health outcomes. Um, you could share, make sure you're sharing information in a comprehensible, interactive, and structured way. Uh, these could be uh, information w about mental health, substance use, medical, uh, coping skills, triggers, warning signs, medication management, allowing time for a client to ask questions, including any family or caregiver in the discussion if possible, um, including behavioral in interventions. Um, for sleep, hygiene, nutrition, um, any of those those types of things. So, Andy, do we have any additional um, comments? Um, just a couple. One was uh, assessing the ability to make her own financial decisions specifically, mm -hmm. and another was you know making sure that she is safe on the streets. So, not necessarily focusing on housing services, um, especially if she would agree to that, um, but how to keep her safe while she is on the streets. Perfect. Thank you. So, so much wisdom. So, okay. Well, last but not least, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, we have slides and resources for you all. I have put, I have put links in where I had the ability to give you links in the handout PDF. But so part three, so some models to address the need. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about California very quickly. I live in California. Uh, California is, is, um, probably the state with one of the largest uh, overall um, problems um, with, with housing affordability, homelessness, and housing instability. Um, and the uh, case complexity and the, um, the way that our state uh, has progressed has led to some changes to statute. So very quickly, and you can look these up, um, in January 2022, uh, each California County APS, uh, the the age for eligibility was went from 65 to 60. Um, because of the identification of complex cases and case needs and clients with cognitive impairment and homelessness, um, APS is, is able and has the flexibility to provide longer term case management. Um, the Home Safe program is enshrined, enshrined in statute, uh, and there's mention of MDTs and forensic centers. So um, I must say that I, for all of the states and models I'm talking about, we do not have APS program administrators present to discuss them. So I've based this on off of research, listening to networking sessions, and my prior experiences and jobs. Um, so prior, but I do want to say that we don't have the voices of the programs today, um, so I am reporting out. Um, Home Safe, for those of you who are unaware, was piloted in 25 of the 58 counties in California. It's been expanded to all 58. It's, a, it's administered at the county level, and it supports the safety and housing stability of seniors and adults with disabilities, served by or in the intake process for APS who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. And this also um, includes um, uh, clients who are being served through tribal social service agencies. So at the county level, um, some counties in their home safe pilots did a home safe combo with a longer term case management and saw a pretty positive um, outcomes. Uh, many of you may have went to the 2021 NAPSA conference and heard Santa Cruz County talk about their home safe pilot. Uh, they did home safe plus transforming lives with care, which was longer term case management. Um, they are now thinking about what the next phase will look like for their home safe um, program. It's still in development. So I reached out to Santa Cruz County. Um, also, before Home Safe was, uh, I think even before it existed, Monterey County 
um, created a multidisciplinary outreach team in MDOT, and that was APS and law enforcement, uh, the police. And they united with behavioral health, medical services, domestic violence services, homeless services. It really created a great program, really great multidisciplinary team program. Um, so uh, I provided a link to a conference presentation um, that they group that MDOT did at the County Welfare Directors Association conference. Um, some of the uh, formula grant funded uh, programs and models that are out there. I spoke, uh, thank you to Amber Moore for sharing um, what West Virginia is doing with ARPA funds. They are, par are partnering with West Virginia Coalition to End Homelessness to fund two positions, APS Liaison and Aged and Elder Resource Navigator. And they are specifically gonna help um, older adults experiencing homelessness or recently housed and in need of other resources. And then I talked to Ke uh, Kelly Cordell um, about the home stabilization program in South Carolina. It's small and funded with one-time grant money um, and they're really excited about it. They developed a grant process with the AAAs and the ADRCs for home stabilization work, home repairs, upkeep. So things like air conditioning, flooring, plumbing, um, those requests come to the APS administration. Um, the, uh, the person has to own, own the home or the landlord has to agree to the fixes. And they're especially excited because they've never been able to do home repairs before. Um, there's no state funding for APS, and so they're relying solely on SSBG. So very excited and, and happy to have the ability to, to work um, and develop a home stabilization program, at least in the short term. And then those of you who um, joined us on July 14th uh, during the self-neglect uh, webinar heard Joyce Reed talk about the CREST program. Collaborative Responses to End Self-Neglect. Now it is in Tennessee, it's a little bit broader, but it does offer case management and one-time rent assistance to folks um, um, who are self-neglecting and um, at risk of losing housing. So those are just a few different um, models that I was able to pull together. And again, so resources. Um, Highly, highly recommend everybody check out that virtual curricula um, that I wouldn't have been able to do this webinar without um, the Effectively Working APS Cases for Persons Experiencing Homelessness series curricula. There is the link there, uh, free to download, a trainer manual, PowerPoint, a participant manual, and all of the other goodies. Um, we also last year did a TARC webinar on the more urgent and emergency, emergent kind of issues around housing. Um, so uh, that is a link there for urgent housing programs for APS clients. We talked a lot about substance abuse and mental health. Um, we have two toolkits, uh, one on each, and there's the link there. And then I really wanna get a, give a shout out to a new, um, a new resource center um, through ACL. Housing and Services Resource Center. I don't know if any of you have uh, participated in their webinars yet, go check them out. A uh, really great uh, goal of connecting um, community, uh, pro community providers and housing, housing services of all realms together so that um, we can share with each other the different resources that are out there. So with that, I'm gonna, we have about three minutes for any questions. I'm so sorry, y'all. We missed about 10 minutes in the beginning, so. That's okay, I think uh, that was really good information. I think everyone found that helpful. So okay. I think it's all right that we only have a few minutes left. Um, so okay. Get, get to a couple questions. Of course, sure. I'm a little biased. Um, so one question, I'm curious if there are any distinct significant differences and what homelessness looks like in different areas of the country, depending on the season, uh, depending on the climate. So this person saying, oh. are there more in the South than in the North? Would you see more cases in Alabama versus North Dakota? Um, it's a very valid question. I don't know if you came across anything in your research. That is a very valid question. So I can't speak from a research perspective, but I can speak from a person who has lived and grown up in a, a climate that is pretty forgiving. Um, and I and also traveled to some places where the climate is not so forgiving. And I 
I personally have experienced um, and talked with colleagues in um, places that don't get so hot in the summer and not so cold in the winter that um, populations can live outdoors easier um, in, in those type of climates. Um, but I've also, I've also talked to colleagues who places where there are more extreme summers and um, the idea of, of potentially opening cooling places, warming places, and then there's the places that just get so bitterly cold. Um, and I would invite, actually, I, I'm going to now start asking, <laughs> I'm going to start asking this question because I don't have anything definitive. Um, but I'm curious if anybody just wanted to put in the the questions box so that we can read out. If you are one of those in one of those colder climates, how does how does houselessness look for you all? How how are folks doing it? Not doing it? Um, Good deal. Um, let's see. There's we'll probably have time for one more question. Sure. Re regarding APS funded temporary housing, is that local, state, or federal funds that pay for that? And let me know if you want me to hop in on that. Again, uh, APS um, funded temporary yeah. housing, is that local, state, or federal funding that pays for that? Well, what I have learned over the last year being at the TARC um, is that a lot of programs are using their uh, federal funny, funding, their ARPA monies or SIRSA monies to, to um, have these programs. Um, I know in California that that is state level funding. They might be leveraging some federal funding, but I, I shouldn't speak to that. Um, so for like the home safe program, um, that's state funding. Um, Andy, do you want to hop in? Sure. I will say it's, it's, it's a combination of all those. I mean, it, uh, I've seen yeah. it funded at the local level. I've seen it funded at the state and now the federal level since there's some designated funding for APS. So it's really a combination of all that and what the priorities are for the community and, and that sort of thing. So it can be paid from any of those sources of funding, certainly. So before we leave, it looks like Samantha said in severe cold, there are shelters, but not, not in regular cold. We're in Virginia. Thank you, Samantha. And then Patrick. They seem to disappear, abandoned homes maybe. Yeah, no. Thank you for that question. I, I think that that's one that, um, that we should definitely um, kind of tackle and I'll see if there's any research out there. Great. Um, if we go to the next slide, I think we will wrap things up there. Thank you so much for attending today. You're going to get an evaluation or a brief, very brief survey. I think it's five questions. As soon as you exit out, please take that for us. That'd be very helpful. Or um, take the follow-up survey that comes in your email tomorrow. It's the same survey. If you um, aren't able to uh, respond to it today, you'll get it in the email that you get tomorrow with your certificate of attendance. Um, here is how you can contact us. It's up on your screen and it's in the slides you can download or that will be posted online as well later on. We hope you can join us next month, September 8th. We have a uh, uh, sort of webinar or interactive discussion, I will say, on an innovations town hall on APS language, talking about the language we use to refer to our clients uh, in, in the APS world and, and where we're going with that and where we should go. So we hope you can join us for that. If you're not familiar with the registration details, just reach out to us by one of these methods right here or Google us at APS TARC. You'll find our webpage. Uh, thanks so much, Krista, for all the information you provided today. I think it was fabulous. Thanks to all of our attendees today for coming. Um, we hope to see you on our webinar next month. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks.